I really wasn't sure if you were you're waiting for me or if I was waiting for you for a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was just like this truck kind of sound behind, so I wanted like let that go and then give it like a couple of seconds. <laughs> a little blue truck rolled into the city. <laughs> Num number one book you should read as an Android developer: Little Blue Truck. <laughs> Our listeners are going to love that recommendation. If you get stressed out, just crack open a little blue truck. <laughs> From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. This week on the Fragmented Podcast, Kaushik and I talk about the top 10 books that we feel Android developers should read. Now, by all means, this is not a full conclusive list of all the books that someone should read or only these 10 books. We actually had a humongous list, probably close to 50 books that we were trying to distill down to a list of 10. And this is the 10 that we felt are probably very important. Now, we also have a small honorable mention section at the end, so stay tuned for that at the end of the episode. But we really hope you enjoy today's episode and where we talk about why we feel these 10 books are books you should take a look at if you haven't already. Speaking of which, so what are we going to talk about today? I think today what we're going to try to do is share uh, our book recommendations for our listeners. What do you think about that? I think that's fantastic. It's something that uh, I have always been very passionate about. And you, you bring it up, a lot of people don't read books traditionally. But there's also some, um, I think I read it recently, that physical books are making a comeback, especially in children now, because children just like holding the actual physical book, which is actually very interesting and, uh -huh. and I encourage it. But at the same token, uh, I think there's also a resurgence of folks going back to physical books for uh, technical reasons because some of the technical code is really doesn't really come across that well if you're trying to read it on a Kindle. And actually, when I wrote my books, that was the biggest complaint that I had is the code just got mangled on oh, a, a Kindle device. So, but that's just a fun little fun little fact there. So I think we got we have a list of books here that we wanted to share with you folks here on the podcast, and these are in no particular order. Uh, but they are probably our top 10 reads that Kaushik and I feel that would provide the most value to Android developers as a whole. Uh, some may surprise you, some may not so much, but uh, I think it's only best that we hop into it. Kaushik, do you want to take it away with the first one? Yeah, uh, and I should mention, while many of these are like uh, specific for Android developers, like in general, these I think it's fair to say these are like books that have influenced us in a strong way, right? So yes. we're not necessarily going to give very prescriptive kind of books, which we think are also valuable, but these are just books that we think influenced us in a big way that uh, everyone should read, right? 100%, yep. If All I could right. give that 100% emoji right there, that's, I would put it on <laughs> All righty, so let's get this started. The first one is the most obvious one that both of us like feel very strongly about. In fact, we've actually done a lot of uh, we've worked with this book uh, in Fragmented as well, and that's Effective Java, right, by mm -hmm. Joshua Block. So this is this is like the granddaddy of all like book recommendations. I mean, you know, this is almost always there in like all the recommendations, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great book. We have like an ongoing uh, series where we talk about uh, each of these items in Effective Java. Uh, and Don's been doing like a fantastic job uh, right now of like you know keeping us up to date with some of these items. Uh, definitely, this is like a must read. This is like a no brainer. And but if you're feeling super lazy, then I would say just we have a link, and we'll try to throw this link in as well, where we link to just the effective Java items. Uh, and yeah, like the idea, it is a decently long book. There are quite a few items, and so what we try yes. to do is we cover each of these items one by one in small fragments. Uh, yeah, and we'll throw that link there. So even if you don't get a chance to read the book completely, definitely listen to it. Right. Uh, yeah, I I think the, one of the cool things about this book, which is is very similar to a few other books that I've read, you know, is the way that it's broken down, and that there's a, each chapter is like an item that you you can understand. So, 
it's not like some other technical books where you sit down and it's like this huge tome of like information like this is everything you need to know about programming in Java. Not at all. It has a ton of great information about Java tips, tricks, even like little weird gotchas you probably never knew about. But I really like the fact that it's broken down into these little items. I forget exactly how many items there are, but there's a, a good number of them. Do you remember off the top of your head how many there are? I think this has 77 or 78 items. Holy uh, cow. Yeah, so this, I mean, it would depend on which edition, again, as we mentioned. They say you can basically like read it from uh, cover to cover. I would not suggest that, though, because, again, it's so dense. Uh, you got to like take it in chunks, and it's it's perfect for that. Like Take an item a day or maybe a week, and yeah, uh, power through this. In general, getting a proper understanding of how Java works, this is really important. It is. There's... <laughs> I've been programming for was was the years of 2017, so 17 plus years at this point, and there's still things that I look in here and like I had no idea that worked that way, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. and I sometimes feel like an idiot when I read it, and I'm like, wow, okay, I feel a little more enlightened now. So definitely highly recommended. It's probably going to be at the top of many lists that you see for Java and Android developers. That was our first recommendation. What's what do you think we should recommend as our second book? I'm just going to really hop on this one immediately. This actually happens to be my favorite book on programming probably ever. And this one is called Working Effectively with Legacy Code, and it's by Michael Feathers. In my opinion, this book literally changed the way that I worked with and developed software. And the reason is, just as the title says, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. It sounds super dry and super boring. <laughs> I mean, because who loves legacy code? But the, the reality of the situation is every single one of us has to deal with some type of legacy code at some point in our career. Mm -hmm. And it's only a matter of time to you get to a behemoth or, or a monolith style of application that has no tests and you're not sure where to update things. And to kind of dig really deep into this, this book the how i usually sell people on this book and this is by the way is a book when i'm leading teams i require everyone on the team to read because i buy everyone a copy i don't care how much it costs I buy if there's 10 people on the team i don't care if it's 50 bucks uh, per copy go spend 50 dollars per copy and buy every single person the physical copy and keep it at your desk take it home read it whatever just use it as reference the thing that really hits home with me is the actual names of the chapters and so i'm just gonna read a couple names of the chapters here this is chapter nine's title I can't get this class into a test harness. <laughs> Can it really get any more obvious than that? Chapter six title. Yeah. I don't have much time and I have to change it. Yeah. Chapter seven. Yeah. It takes forever to make a change. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> Chapter 16. This is, a, this is a key one, especially if you're starting in a new company, new project, transition to a different department. I don't understand the code well enough yeah. to change it. <laughs> Uh, so th these the names go on and on and on, but to me, uh, it's been fantastic because Michael Feathers really breaks it down into what you need to do to kind of help get your application, uh, you know, under basically under test, so you can actually work with confidence inside of your application. Have you read this book before, Kaushik? I have. In fact, I have it right on like on my desk right now. It's like right oh, there. Yes. Yeah, this is definitely like I'm completely one hundred percent with you on this. Uh, I've read this book more than once and every time I read it just gives me a little more insight because uh, it is like one of those books that was recommended early on when I was actually in my master's like studying software, uh, mm -hmm. software engineering. And as I've read it over time with little more experience, uh, you know, it started to make a little more sense and it gives me a little more insight, right? Because I remember uh, this was like one of the books that I found really effective in terms of uh, my thinking towards testing, right? Like the concept of like the test harness. In the early days, this was not really something that came naturally to me, right? Like when yeah. I wanted to refactor or like change something, I would just like go at it, right? I would not even think of having the comfort of like a test harness or like, you know, a safety bed that would make sure that, you know, I didn't break functionality while doing whatever I was doing and then get myself into like, you know, it isn't like opening Pandora's box, so. It's like chapter 23. How do I know that I'm not breaking anything? Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> This is, yeah, just folks go read this book. Yes, I completely agree with you. If if and when you pick up this book, when you're done reading it and reading through it, you're going to be able to approach an application that you're not familiar with, with confidence that you didn't have before, because you're going to see 
different things. You're going to see like, all right, I don't know how to t- get this. Like, I know I'm going to change this one piece of code mm-hmm, that affects mm-hmm. these three different screens. And if I change it, I don't know what I'm going to break yet. And this book breaks that down. All right, what you're going to need to do is write tests for these things. Introduce a shim in this location. Here's how you introduce that shim. Here's how you maybe extract this interface. And here's why you would want to do that. And again, a lot of these things that people see in here may not be the end result of what you're going after, but this these are stepping stones because sometimes you don't need that interface in the long term when the application is architected correctly, but to in order to get your application under test and to a place where you can maintain it, you may need to introduce different pieces, and it's just a stepping stone to help get to an end result. And if you keep that in mind, this book is going to be fantastic for you. 100% agreed. So I think that wraps up number two here, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Again, that's by Michael Feathers. Kaushik, why don't you take us on to number three? All right. So the, the next one is this book called Head First Design Patterns, right? And Head First is like this series. Like they've written like a bunch of books. It isn't necessarily just like this one book. They, you know, they try to bring about like a different sort of like way of thinking about like certain books. Uh Design patterns, like there's another book that I think will come along, uh, you know, in our mentions, which is like the granddaddy of like uh, design patterns. Uh, But Mm -hmm. before we get to that, I feel the problem is this is, you know what, this is not a terribly interesting, you know, uh, topic in general. Like design patterns can tend to be boring because it's just like a lot of theory. Unless you've Mm -hmm. actually put it into practice and you can like relate to it, it isn't necessarily something that's very interesting but it is very important. And it's important for a couple of reasons, right? Because it's basically just getting your lexicon right. When you talk to someone and you want to maybe use like design patterns, right? Like uh, we we constantly talk about like, you know, RxJava, like, you know, the PubSub pattern, like the observable pattern, like all these things. These are patterns that you should just include in your dictionary, right? You should just like understand these. And so when you communicate and talk to other people, People have spent time to think about and formulate these concepts, right? Like there are set patterns. And even though you may not necessarily know like those patterns exist and you actually use them in daily life, there's yeah. huge value in knowing what those patterns are so that when uh, you communicate with other people, you can just like use that and immediately both of you are on the same page, right? You don't have to like spend like your time trying to explain like the nuances of the details Everyone's just immediately on the same page if you say that pattern, right? If you say observable pattern. I know what you mean. So definitely I would, uh, this is a book which sort of softens the blow and makes it a little more interesting to read. Uh, So yeah, this is, I think, a very uh, good recommendation. Uh, What are your thoughts on this one? This is the second or third design patterns book that I had bought. This is years ago that I bought this book. And it was the first book, though, that made design patterns click for me. And it was finally, it gave me that aha moment. The light bulb went off in my head of, oh, that's what they mean by decorator. Like I right, get right. it now. They <laughs> use like the examples yeah. of like, okay, you have a, a, a pizza you know, place and you now want to have a cheese pizza. But some people want it with pepperoni, but other people want it with anchovies. And other people want it with onions. And like, but other people want all three of those things. Like how do you build a software system that you know models this type of environment? And they talk about building a decorator. And they go into different things like the facade pattern about how – you know, if you have a universal, you know, you have three different remote controls, one for your uh, DVD player, one for your your sound bar, and one for your TV. But nobody likes carrying around three remote controls. So how do they fix it? They built a universal, you know, remote that controls all three. That's also known as a facade. And they give you these examples, these real world analogies that kind of help connect those dots that fire off those synapses in your brain that make everything connect. And to me, this is also one of the books that I always have on hand when I'm leading a team. I'll put it down if a junior developer is not familiar with design patterns so we can build that terminology and that lexicon within the team. I'll put that down and say, hey, all right, read this one first, and then I'll start recommending the other patterns book, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I love the idea. Uh, have you read some of the other head first uh, uh, books? Do they always follow this pattern? Because I love like the examples and like you know how they make it very – they like, bring in real-life analogies that make it easy. I'm, I haven't read like any of the other head first uh, books and I'm curious if like they follow that same sort of like, you know, uh, formula in like their books. I read, I didn't, can't say I read the whole thing, but I remember perusing another head first book and I saw a very similar approach. And so I can, I can only imagine that they continue that, which is kind of like, uh, you know, when I wrote the dummies books, they have a very particular way of doing it as well. Uh, I can only imagine that the, uh, that the head first folks probably do something similar. Right, right. Oh, yeah. No, actually, now uh, I take that back. I remember I've 
you're going to have a chuckle on this one. You know, the first Head First book that I think I probably read was, uh, wait, is that actually a book? Head First Ajax Patterns. Oh, yes. <laughs> XML HTTP request, is that it? Yeah, that, that's what, Head First Ajax. That's the name of the book. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's like a fun book. Like, you know, they like the, the pictures, it seems like it's mm-hmm. a little more like, and it has a fresh look. To be honest, when the, when this book first came out, the Head First Design Patterns book, it actually got a ton of flack. A lot of industry professionals were like, don't, this is garbage. What is this made for a child? Because <laughs> there's a lot of like cartoony things yeah. in there. They try to make it really fun. But in my opinion, it made it enjoyable. It was not a cure for insomnia. It was something <laughs> I could actually sit down yeah. and read. I'm like, oh, I got it now. And to this day, um, I've probably gone through hundreds of programming books and I'll read them and then I'll donate them to Goodwill or, or to a school or whatever. Uh, but there's a handful of books that I keep on hand and working effectively with legacy code, effective Java and head first design patterns are definitely in the three that I still have at home in physical copies. If you want to throw in a couple of XKCDs in between the books, like, yeah, I'm all down for that. <laughs> Piling code. Yeah. <laughs> Greatest building. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what do you have next on? The next one here is not actually too focused around Android development, but it's actually something that is important with software in general. And this book is actually kind of takes a, a more a different approach here. It's more around UI, UX, if you want to think of it that way. And that's it's called Don't Make Me Think. And this book basically helps you focus on the why things are built the way that they are. And, and in short, simpler things make life easier for your users and make your products more successful. Now, Don't Make Me Think is actually based upon, and this is the version two, I think version three is out now, but version two, which is the one that I uh, remember reading, uh, was based heavily around the web. But even if you read the version two, you can apply a lot of those same principles and patterns to the mobile environment as well, because you know we're just talking about screens here. And at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're doing, they talk about how you're going to design your pages for scanning and you're not reading them because as folks do, and as I do, I'm kind of scanning through looking for the things that I want. Maybe it's a heading or a title that grabs my attention. You know, you want to make people, you when they use an application, they shouldn't have to always think about this when they're actually develop when they're using it. Like, all right, what's the next step? It should just be completely obvious to them. So it has a bunch of great tips and tricks in there. I highly recommend, you know, grabbing a copy, setting it down almost as a, uh, you can put it on your coffee table. And when you get home from work or whatever, just pop open a few pages, read a few pages. It's just going to kind of open your eyes up to a whole other part of your software that's going to make you really think about, all right, am I putting this button in the right place? Is this search box the right place? Should I have a hint text here? Should I even be animating that thing that I'm animating? Does that make any sense? So it helps you think a little bit differently. Have you uh, taken a gander at this book at all? Absolutely. And it, I think if you want to become a well-rounded uh, developer in today's world, right, it's important for you to have at least like some understanding, right? Because especially like with stuff like material design, and this is like a very common thing, right? In the early days as Android developers, we've never had designers focus purely on Android designs. And at least in my career, right, a lot of it was just like left to me to make educated decisions on what is right for yes. Android, right? It's still like that. I mean, as you know, I'm, I, I consult and I still deal with that. All the time. There's not an Android designer in the majority of places I go to. Yeah, yeah. And uh, material design has caught up and Google's done a fantastic job with that. Even all that being said, I still think it's valuable for you to just have it as a skill, right? And this book definitely gets you up there. You you rightly mentioned, like, it was built, like, for the web uh, interface days. But I still think, like, the concepts are valuable, right? Like, and those are things that you can easily apply to, like, mobile uh, design as well. Uh, and yeah, 100%. Uh, we should mention this book is by Steve Krug. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, but uh, Steve Krug is uh, the person. He's also uh, an honorable mention. He's, I want to make sure I get the name right. Rocket Surgery Made Easy. Is that the one? There was a sequel. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, I haven't seen that, no. Yeah, this, he wrote a sequel to this book called Rocket Surgery Made uh, Easy. Uh, basically it's, and this, in this, he like touches, I think also like about mobile applications. I don't recollect specifically, uh, but yeah, I would highly recommend folks start off with don't make me think and then, uh, proceed to rocket searching made easy. I think he's written another book recently too. So, uh, but yeah, definitely this makes the list. We always like to do a lot of things at once. Do you have any (laughs) ideas of any books that we might be able to read that kind of help us understand how to do a bunch of things at once? (laughs) I love that segue. Uh, 
So this is a book that was actually recommended uh, by our mutual friend who you happened to talk to in our last podcast. Uh, Michael Bailey, I think, uh, recommended this one. It's called Java Concurrency in Practice. Uh, concurrency is known to be one of the most difficult problems in computer science. Like this is like a known thing. Everyone like agrees that this is hard to do. But really, this uh, when we talk about Java concurrency here in this book, this is like hardcore concurrency, right? Like this is old school concurrency. <laughs> yeah. And and I will, this is, I'll give a fair warning. This is not a page turner, folks. Like do not expect to read this and then, exp- you know, uh, this is going to make you sleep. <laughs> There's no better way to say this. This is like extremely terse, dense book, but it's extremely valuable. And this uh, as mobile developers, you cannot escape concurrency. You have to have a firm grip of concurrency, right? I would say even, I would go so far as to say that even as a web developer, sometimes you don't necessarily have to worry as much about concurrency. You have to as a mobile developer. And this book will help you get a super firm understanding of, of concurrency. It'll also help shape the way you think. So even if you just work with Rx Java, I think there's a huge value and benefit in reading books like this so that the concepts like start to make sense altogether, right? Do you think that's a fair uh, summary? Yeah, I do. I think you kind of nailed it with the uh, the fact that it's not a huge page turner. It's one of those <laughs> things that's it's highly, yeah. <laughs> highly technical. I mean, if you really find working with futures, executors, all these kind of, you know, threads and, you know, seeing, you know, if you can advance three or four different things in your heads at different time scales in your head, well, then this might be the book for you. Um, but, most of us have a very hard time with that. Long story short, though, this type, this book does really help break down those concepts. And I really wasn't introduced to it until right when I first learned of Rx Java. And this is years ago. And uh, Ben Christensen, so one of the guys who helped create Rx Java from Netflix, talked about it in his Go conference talk, which I think we can probably link that up in the show notes. It's a quite old talk here. But he actually, I think. Uh, excuse me if I'm paraphrasing this incorrectly, had stated that he dove into that book and it really enlightened him on everything that was happening behind the scenes in Java for concurrency and all the different situations you can get yourself into and kind of real sticky situations you can get yourself into. So this is, again, one of the ones that's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I <laughs> would have to agree with you. It's not going to be... Maybe you might want to put it next to your nightstand so you can help you go to sleep, but... Ow, yeah. <laughs> but at the same... T- the same token, it might be something that's uh, that's good to have there, so you can actually have something to to think about and, and kind of sleep on overnight because uh, these are very dense topics. Yeah, and if it's any validation, this our good friend, well, not our good friend, but someone we talk about constantly, Joshua Block, uh, is one of the writers for this book, so that should be good validation for this book. So, and I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to discount this book. This book is literally one of the top books that that the folks need to read if you're working in Java for a long time. I think we're just making sure it's a very strong warning that yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't sit down with us and then be like really pumped up like, all right, I'm totally going to fire through this thing in a couple of hours. That's not going to happen. Come at that. We're trying to level set you here. Like get the book. Yeah. Give yourself some time. Like, all right, I'm going to read a chapter. I'm going to digest it. I'm going to come back to it in a couple of days, read another chapter. Um, mm-hmm. It may be a little bit difficult. You may, may run into those situations where you read, four or five pages, and then you kind of wonder, like, what did I just read? And you have to go read it again. So that's all. This is not like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, or Game of Thrones. <laughs> like, this is probably something you'll have to maybe, you know, nudge yourself a little to read. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Uh, okay, this next book uh, comes very highly recommended from you, Don. I haven't actually read this one, so can you tell us what this one is about? Yeah, I read this one a long time ago. It's called X Unit Testing patterns. And long story short, it just contains a, a bunch of information about just testing in general. And as, as everyone has heard here on the show, we're huge proponents of testing. And uh, if we even if you go back to recommendation number two here, which is working effectively with legacy code, and you read that book, you end up seeing that, uh, that everything that the author talks about, Michael, Michael Feathers, is that your code is basically considered legacy until there's some tests that are around it. And that's kind of the general consensus there. So in regards to testing, though, there's how do you do it the right way? What's the wrong way? How do you get certain things under test? You know, the book, Working Effectively Legacy Code, can help you get there. But even when you start writing unit tests, you can start introducing some some new patterns. Now, this book is a little bit older, so there are some new patterns that have come around, like the robot pattern and so forth, which have been talked about all over the place. 
But this one contains a bunch of different stuff, like what are test double patterns? You know, what are spies? What are different test smells? How are different test strategies used? What are some tools you can use? What are, you know, some result verification patterns that are out there? How do you properly set up your test? Maybe how do you properly tear them down? How do you make sure that you're interacting with databases uh, correctly and so forth? Uh, it goes into website stuff as well, but it's just one of those ones that's great to use. If you're not interested in going out and buying the book, I believe, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a um, site which is xunittestpatterns.com. We'll put the link in the show notes, and that actually has all of the stuff that's in the book from what I can tell. It's been a while since I visited, but it has all the test double stuff that I just talked about and all that kind of good old stuff too. Oh, wow. Yeah, I see this. It does, yeah, there's a link. Uh, I'm not sure if they put in the actual content, but I think like they have, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll add a link. Uh, we'll add a link in the show notes to this. So I think uh, folks can have a look. I'm actually curious, like, this is funny, like, you know, because a lot of like these concepts I learned by use of like specific tools, like Makito has like concepts of like spies and like, you know, doubles and test doubles. And that's how I've learned these things. It's, yeah, it's, it's funny. Like, uh, yeah, I didn't know these were like actually established patterns that like were talked about. Like, I didn't know this was already built into the lexicon. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. I mean, if you, if you talk about, uh, you know, just, you know, stubs versus mocks and all that stuff, like oh, there's yeah. even the uh -huh. great, uh, that great blog post by Martin Fowler about mocks versus stubs as well. Mm -hmm. Speaking about Martin Fowler, we have, uh, yeah, folks must be thinking, wait, how did these guys not like bring in a book uh, by Martin Fowler? And uh, fear not, we have this next <laughs> one. <laughs> so uh, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. This wins the award for the most boring title, uh, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I think Microsoft created this title. <laughs> yeah, it's probably. Now, Martin Fowler, I think uh, I rate him extremely highly. Like if I had to like pick the top engineers who like I worship in, uh, you know, just in terms of like how they have influenced my way of coding, Martin Fowler is up there. Uh, so I have complete respect for him. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a fantastic book. This book, uh, a lot of like, I, so I gave a talk uh, recently, Don, about, uh, the presenter patterns, like what I learned from the presenter patterns. I've given a talk before that where I've talked about like MVP, MVM, MV, MVVM, like all these things. And a lot of that, in fact, 70 to 80% of that has been influenced completely by just this book, right? Uh, by Martin Fowler. And I think he actually started out uh, with huge blog posts, right? And these are like meaty, meaty blog posts. He does, yeah, humongous blog posts. Those are the ones that I initially read, and like that's what got me like onto like this uh, concept. So yeah, uh, what do you think about this one? This is one of those books that I read in the two thousands that is just phenomenal. I worked with the guy at uh, that followed Fowler, and and I had read a couple of his blog posts, not really knowing who he was at the time, and then uh, he turned me on a couple more of them, and we like show me the mocks or not stubs, and we got into whole like service layer, and then. I said, why don't you go pick out this book? And uh, I had ordered it and it came and it was actually one of the, I think it was the second book that I really wrapped my head around after Head First Design Patterns, I moved on to this one. And this is the one that really kind of, kind of making the glue kind of just really stick inside of my head for all of the different types of patterns. And the one reason why I really like this book is because there's good diagrams in there, but they really break it down of like, here's your current situation. Here's maybe why... Uh, here's this pattern. Here's why you'd want to use it. Because when if you don't, you're going to run into these these other type of situations. And here's why it's bad. And here's how this pattern can help you. However, it's also really good too because sometimes we'll talk about things like, for example, the uh, model view presenter pattern, which is very popular in Android. And sometimes you'll have you know I think it's supervising controller is one version of it, and then passive view is another version of oh, it. Yeah. And he actually talks about the differences between these two and when you're going to want to use one, when you're going to want to use the other, and when it may not even be appropriate to use either one of them. <laughs> and so to me, that really kind of hit home with me because sometimes I felt that people have the habit of having patternitis where they, yeah. <laughs> they like hear a pattern and yeah. they're like, oh, this is fantastic. This is, uh, this is a strategy pattern or the visitor pattern. I am going to use this everywhere. You're like, that doesn't need to be used there. That makes no <laughs> sense over there, but just because yeah. they've used it. And this, this book really kind of helped break it down. Be pragmatic about applying patterns. Yeah. And to be clear, Martin Fowler came up with these patterns, right? Like he came up with the presenter, the supervising presenter, the passive view patterns. He came up with these by when he actually like 
and that like he after he came up with these patterns he's like oh i should probably write a book and I, this is the culmination of that effort yeah him and a bunch of other folks i think there's some co-authors on the on the book if i remember correctly and it, i mean a lot of the stuff comes back from the small talk days yeah, yeah. and uh yeah, yeah. him and a bunch of other folks you know helped design and, and refine a lot of these patterns and a lot of it's talked about in this book which is really fantastic we have covered seven books so far the next three uh in my opinion are not necessarily directly related to programming like you're not going to find too much code necessarily well actually i shouldn't say that you're definitely going to find code but it's not directly related to like java or like android code that you find but i still think these are like really good and uh, they should make the list uh, w- uh what's the next one don have you ever been around parents like when uh they're they have kids and they say and they, mm-hmm. they look at the kids and they say earmuffs because they're gonna say a bad word you know uh, <laughs> yeah 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 uh-huh So I'm going to warn all of the Android developers out there. You might want to put <laughs> earmuffs on yourself here for a second. Oh, I love this. Um, uh-huh. and the reason why I say this is because the book here that Kaushik and I put on the list here is actually called JavaScript, The Good Parts. And I think I just felt everybody cringe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When, <laughs> We're going to get a lot that. of email about this one. <laughs> we, we and you before the call... we're trying to figure out should we include this or not and I was like I don't know if we should include it. it's not android and you're like and you brought up a good point of why we should include it would you mind saying exactly what you said before the call all right so here's the thing folks you have to keep you have to always keep an eye out for like the patterns and like the interesting things that are happening in our industry right and whether you like it or not i will say this i'm not a big fan of javascript but whether i like it or not react native is becoming a very very important thing right and don and i have been like formulating our thoughts and like we also have like uh, some folks in mind that we want to talk to in detail so like stay tuned for that but the thing is i if i had to make a bet for a language that eventually would be the universal language at least in the near term future whether we like it or not i think javascript is going to be that language right react native like you have really big uh companies that are like betting really huge in javascript right uh and i think in general it is important enough to just be aware of these patterns right because if it so happens that one day you work in a company and they say hey we are all react native and you are an android developer you shouldn't find yourself fumbling you should be able to at least have a basic idea of the concepts of javascript you should know javascript because whether you like it or not javascript is an important language all of the web relies so heavily on uh, javascript right mm-hmm. and i think it is if i have to say you want to pick up a language today like the advantage i think that both of us have is like we started off in the web development days right yep. so both of us know yep. javascript uh, so i think it is very important for folks today to also get a good understanding because javascript is also quite a gnarly language it's not as easy or structured as you would think uh, i mean like the common like you know the joke is like javascript like basically was built very shortly right like you know it's such a versatile language but mm-hmm. it was built like i think like over like you know like a week or something 90s or something. yeah, yeah, yeah 90s in a couple of weeks by yeah yeah it was built really quickly and has quickly become like the de facto like universal language right uh, i know there was uh, someone told me recently like even at like google like one of the most if you had to pick like the top 3 languages that are used the most i think javascript is up there so uh, this is definitely a language that i feel folks should be aware of whether you like it or not uh, and this is a good book that should at least uh if anything like you know javascript the good parts talks about the good parts of javascript like there are clearly many like gnarly and bad parts but this talks about like all the good things that javascript admittedly it's a small book uh, i know what that says about javascript but <laughs> uh but definitely uh folks should read this one what do you think i think uh i mean you you nailed it on the head there i've been saying since 2010ish i think right around there that eventually and I'm probably going to get really roasted for this but eventually uh the web is going to come in and we're going to be developing web style for android apps now that means like are we going to be developing javascript like react native uh are we doing that? I don't know what it's going to be but if we're starting to see that that the web is always in the forefront of everyone's mind that that's basically what's running everything right now we're talking about APIs everything react native's taking over with a lot of stuff So as you stated, it's really good to be aware of what's happening in the industry and be familiar with what is going on and that language right now is JavaScript. When people start learning 
code in high school and so forth, they start learning a lot of JavaScript. Why? Because you can create a web page. You can test it on any computer. It has a browser. It's easy to do. JavaScript is already there. I don't need to install anything really. So it's really important to understand that. And if you can understand JavaScript, that's the key. But that's the part, understanding JavaScript. <laughs> that's the hard part. <laughs> yeah. um, JavaScript is you know, it looks easy and some of it is easy. However, there's some really weird things that go on inside of JavaScript oh, sometimes. Yeah. And I'm going to link to a talk here uh, that's on destroyallsoftware.com. Oh, called, I love this one. I love this called, one. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's hilarious. It's probably one of the best talks I've ever seen. And it's like five minutes long. It's it's a great laugh. But he, the, the, the speaker shows some of these weird idiosyncrasy things that are within JavaScript. But the reason why I bring that up is because Douglas Crockford, the author of JavaScript, The Good Parts, talks about the majority of these weird things. And these things are like, you know, scoping issues that you get inside of with JavaScript. When you're like concatenating, adding things together, how JavaScript interprets those things, how are you going to want to use, you know, reference like this and all these different number types of things. This book, again, it's it's very small. It's very thin. I mean, if you were to look at it sitting on the desk, it's probably half an inch tall. It's very small. Uh, it's another one of the books I have at my house that just sits there because I love to just pick it up every once in a while, peruse through it. Personally, I still do feel that JavaScript and those other languages are going to start taking over soon. When it's going to happen, I don't know. I don't think our devices are there yet. I don't think the bandwidth is there yet. But one day in the future, we might see it coming. And I think that React Native right now is that tip of the iceberg that I've been been waiting to see for a long time. Yeah, I mean, you, you put it really well. There are like some really weird things also that happen in JavaScript. Uh, mm -hmm. JavaScript hoisting is like yeah. one of the things that really did like get me what? because like you know, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking about Gary Bernhardt is like I think his videos like were one of the early ones that really impressed me. The guy's a monster. Like how fast like you. You should, like, folks should also, like, see Destroy All Software. We'll drop a link in the show notes. Guy is a magician on Vim. Like, the, like one of the, I, I, even, in, like, though I never used to, like, actually, follow, like, code in the same languages. Like, he does a lot of, like, Ruby stuff, right? So, in those days, I was, like, following more actively. But just seeing him play around with his, like, play around with Vim and his tools, like, really is impressive, right? Uh, when you're a kid, like when you see like someone like dance around their keyboard, like these days it's like become normal for us, right? So it isn't necessarily something that we find that entertaining. But uh, wow, that guy is like he flies on his like keyboard. Like yeah, you folks should definitely like you know at least like watch it for that. I don't know if I see, if I see someone flying around on Vim now, I'm still impressed. I'm like wow. All right, <laughs> All right so we've made everybody cringe long enough by talking right, about right. their favorite language, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, maybe there's a, a certain way that we can help them? kind of write some code that maybe with JavaScript or another language that's a little more readable. Do you have any recommendations for a book that might do that? Well, the next one that we have on our list is this one called Clean Code. So hey. if, if you feel like, yeah, if you feel like, ooh, you've gotten like a feel shudder. Dirty, from, yeah? yeah, you feel like a little dirty in the game. You're, you're <laughs> shuddering like from all that uh, JavaScript goodness. Clean Code is like a, a pretty good book. And this is like really highly recommended, right? Like everyone recommends this book. Uh, if you want to write code that is like, maintainable it's easy to read it's also like invariably if you actually just see top uh programmer like you know if you like search around on google like for lists for like top books that uh programmers should read uh this book clearly like comes up there right it was written by like robert martin and uh i think uh, if you think of yourself as like a software engineer like you know someone who cares about like the art and like the craft of writing good code this book should definitely, like, you know, he talks about how to write, like, easy to read and, like, maintainable code. Like, you know, the things that I feel in the end are actually the most important thing to be a good software engineer, right? These are things that are actually really hard to pick up. You know, you can learn a language pretty easily. You can build, like, a Android app quickly. Like, anyone can do that. But if you want to really up your game, if you want to, like, reach that next level, like, you know, want to be considered an actual senior engineer, right? Like, you want to really be good at the craft, there are like these things that you pick up along the way that, you know, usually people attribute just to experience. These are things that like, you know, if you've been working for some time, you pick it up and the industry really values these because like these are the things that sort of help the other folks in your team also become better developers, right? Yep. Writing clean code, identifying when you should be doing something and when you shouldn't be doing something, right? Things that you would otherwise attribute to your gut uh, are actually like many of these concepts, like how do you write maintainable and clean code. I think you, you, you nailed it there. And the 
literally the, the name of the, the book is like the best it could be. It's, it's simple and it nails exactly what he's talking about here. And I really like, as I did in the Working Effectively with Legacy Code book, I like to name some of the chapters or the things that, that he talks about there. And and for example, I'm looking at the, the chapter list now and Uncle Bob Martin talks about, you know, just like functions and like how they should do one thing is actually one of the headings in one of the, the chapters. You know, how you make sure you're using descriptive names, as you mentioned. You make sure your your function arguments, uh, how they're how you're using them correctly. Make sure they have no side effects, et cetera. Make sure you're using your, your comments uh, correctly. And he even goes into different parts later in the book where there's different smells of your application code. Uh, and heuristics you should look for, like poorly written comments or a, a build that requires more than one step or s- functions that have too many arguments or or things like this or duplication or wrong levels of abstraction. Uh, so, so many good things inside of here. This is, you know, it's a, it's a lengthy book. You know, I think it's close to 400 or a little over 400 pages it's long. It's a huge book. Yeah, it's a huge book. So, there's uh-huh. a ton of information in there. And it's, again, one of those things that's it's action-packed. Like, the whole thing is action-packed. So, you could re- just sit it down and read it. And let's be honest, a lot of people aren't going to read a lot of 400-page books. However, if you're still wanting to consume this code, uh, there's also a course on Pluralsight, which a lot of companies have Pluralsight subscriptions. You can go to Pluralsight, and actually my friend of mine, Corey House, has created a, a course here. It's Clean Code, Writing Code for Humans, and it's basically a course based upon, based around the clean coding book. Oh, interesting. So, uh, if you're more of a video learner, check out the Pluralsight Coursera. We don't get any kickbacks from it, so this is just a a, uh, a recommendation to make life easier for you. So definitely worth taking a look at the book or the video course. That makes sense. I like it. All right, so we talked about some clean code uh, after we got dirty with JavaScript. That's good. <laughs> um, but let's get a little bit dirty again here. Kaushik, you actually <laughs> recommended this next book here, and I haven't read it yet, and it's something that's on my list. So I'm going to look to you for insight here. And this one is known as, and I'll let you roll with it here. Coders at Work. Now, this whole At Work series is like this book that uh, where basically you have like one this one uh, journalist or you have like this person who interviews people of fame in the industry, right? So mm-hmm. the one that really did uh, make the rounds was Founders at Work. And this is by Jessica Livingston. And she's one of like uh, uh, the founders uh, along with Paul Graham like at YC, uh, Y Combinator, mm-hmm. right? Founders at Work is like this hugely recommended book. Like if you work in startups, this is like they say the book that you're like given to read like on day one, right? If it's your day one at a startup, because it tells you about real stories of real entrepreneurs and founders, how they built their companies and how certain things fail, right? Uh, that is a fantastic book in itself. Uh, so that should go in our honorable mentions. They, they, I think they talk to like people like uh, the PayPal founders, like you know, like a lot of these stories that have become like common now are from that book. That's cool. In the same vein. There's another book that was written called Coders at Work, right? And this is by Peter Siebel. And essentially, what he does is pretty much the same thing. He goes to like some of these amazing uh, coders, as he calls them, or programmers that we know of, who are like of world fame, right? And like, these are people that are super, super famous, right? And he asks them about their stories. And I always find this is super interesting Uh it's almost like mentorship, right? Like you always want to, like if you find someone who's really good, like a top uh, developer or programmer, I think there's a lot to learn from their story, right? How they think about things, like what influenced their decisions, what have made them think in a specific way. Yeah. Uh, And this book does exactly that. It talks to like, I'm going to tell you a bunch of like the folks, uh, again, our good friend, uh, or uh, that we know, that he probably doesn't know us, Joshua Block. (laughs) (laughs) Joshua Block is in this book. He's interviewed in this book. Donald Knuth, uh, uh, another super famous person. If you've like uh, studied computer science, like this name should sound uh, sound familiar, right? Uh, Douglas Crockford. We just talked about uh, Douglas Crockford. He's in this book. A whole bunch of people, like Brendan Eich. Uh, I'm pronouncing oh, yeah. all these uh, names uh, names probably like, completely incorrectly. I recommend this book really highly. I think definitely folks should read this book because it's also like very inspiring. Like uh, I know I know about you, Ron, but I love reading like biographies of like folks or like, you know, real biographies of people who've uh, done something or made something of themselves in this world. Just because I feel there are glimpses that we can pick up on and that, you know, that can incrementally improve our lives in some ways. And so that's why I really highly recommended this book because I think 
as programmers, there's a lot to learn from other programmers and developers. I completely agree. I, I, I wish I had more to add to this, but I just haven't read this book yet, but it's something that is uh, on my list. Yeah, uh, I highly recommend it. So I think that's our list of like 10 books. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with this list. Like, you know, if I had to like recommend, if someone came to me and asked me like, hey, what are the 10 books? Uh, this is a good one. Okay, so those are our top 10 books Android developers should read. Now, again, these are not in any particular specific order. I do have my favorites. Kaushik has his favorites. And I'm sure that all the listeners here are going to have their own levels of favorites. And we've probably even missed some in, inside of here that other developers feel that we should read. Kaushik, let's go through and give a quick recap of the titles just for the folks out there. Uh, so we started out with the book that we think is super, super important. And I strongly believe both of us believe in this one. Effective Java by Joshua Block. That was the first one that we covered. That's right. Number two here, we have Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Again, super useful if you're going to hop into any code base that uh, doesn't have any tests or things you're not familiar with. And the next one we then uh, talked about is Head First Design Patterns. Uh, this was, again, as we talked about, improving that lexicon. Great book. Number four, Don't Make Me Think. Again, help your users and yourself develop applications that are simpler to use. Java Concurrency in Practice. That was the fifth book. Also the cure for insomnia, but an important topic. Uh, that was, yeah, that was book number five. Exactly. Number six, X-Unit Testing Patterns. So if you're wondering how to do something with various different tests, uh, check out this book. It has a lot of good tips in it. And the next one by uh, Martin Fowler, aka Presenter Guru, <laughs> uh, uh, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. Don't let that name fool you. Number eight, earmuffs, JavaScript, <laughs> the good parts. So again, uh, there's lots of stuff happening in the industry. Just uh, be aware of it. Don't let yourself be surprised. Yeah. And if you want something to like wash it down, book number nine, clean code. <laughs> and finally, uh, the one that I talked about with uh, stories of like famous developers, Coders at Work by Peter Siebel. So that was our list of 10 books. I think this is a pretty good list. I like it. Yeah, that's a good list. There's lots of good stuff in here. However, there are tons of books out there that folks have recommended that we read. There's other books that when we first started brainstorming this, we probably had 50 books in this list. And oh, yeah. we, it was really hard to get it down to a list of 10. We went back and forth on this for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we did want to provide a few honorable mentions of other books we felt are really yeah. important uh, to the industry. So I'm going to hop right into it. And I'm just going to give you a, you know, a quick sentence on each one of them. So this one is called Release It. This is a, a, sm like a smaller book. It's on how to scale and, and grow your software to be prepared for the unknown. So maybe if you're, what happens when your application gets hit with by a hacker news crowd or if it has a large number of traffic or what happens when the database is not reacting the way you expect it to. It just allows you to help prepare for unknown situations. So the name of that is Release It, and that's from the Pragmatic Publishers. Oh, nice. I like it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that one, too. I haven't read it. Uh, the next book that we have recommended, and we alluded to this uh, previously uh, in the episode, is Original, The Original <laughs> Design Patterns. And uh, I think this is also, like, this is the Gang of Four, as they've called, right? Like, this is the Gang mm -hmm. of Four book. Uh, this one is, I would say, the original cure for <laughs> insomnia. Like, Oh, folks, this book, this, this is like probably one of the most influential books in our industry. It talks about all these patterns, like these super smart people came together and formed this pattern that has become like the bedrock of like how we as software engineers build software today. Man, this book, though, oof, it took me like many, many months to finish this one, right? I had to force myself and eventually like, you know, uh, well, yeah, it was like, I think when I was studying ma my master's, like I was told, like, hey, you got to really finish this book. <laughs> so uh, again, fair warning, but again, very influential book. And I'm sure like a whole bunch of people would like say, why didn't you include this one? So we are adding it here. Yep. Uh, when you order that book from Amazon, order a case of Red Bull too. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the next one, uh, Pragmatic Programmer. This one is kind of an industry standard. A lot of folks really love it. It's kind of a, um, it's been around for, for many years. It has a bunch of different tips inside of there, such as like don't repeat yourself. Um, make sure that, you know, you remember the big picture when you're developing applications. Care about your craft, all mm -hmm. different types of stuff. Prototype, the, your you know, before you implement your real thing. Fix the problem, uh, not point fingers at it. So a bunch of, of soft skills are in here but just tons and tons of information. And that's the Pragmatic Programmer. All right. This next book is actually a little off. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very different book. And that's why I also want to add it in. It's actually called Code. The name of the book is just Code, The Hidden Language of Computer Hardware and Software. 
And the reason I want to add this like uh, book is because I think it's a fantastic book and it helps you think about hardware. Like most of us as application developers and software developers don't necessarily understand sometimes the nuts and bolts. And I think this book does like a very good job of gradually building a story, right? Like uh, the author like starts off like very basic, like, you know, then he talks about how uh, the Braille language was, uh, uh, came about, how like Morse code came about. And, you know, he gradually builds this idea. And then he talks about, oh, how the binary concepts like moved into hardware and how uh, folks thought of like moving into hardware and how computers like came about, right? I think this is definitely a book you should have read. And even if you want to, if you have like, you know, like, uh, if you have like kids like Don does and like they're slowly starting to get interested in like computer science and programming and they reach a certain age, this book is a good recommendation. I feel it's a fantastic book. Uh, I love reading this book. So I want to like throw that out there as well. The next one here is uh, is Soft Skills and that's by John Somnes. As developers, we're really good at being introverts sitting inside and kind of just doing the things that we do in front of a computer by ourselves. There's a lot of other things in life though that uh, that are required and a lot of those do require soft skills. And, and what I mean by those is maybe something about productivity or about your career, about how to market yourself, about how to learn properly, your financial well-being, you know, any type of spiritual well-being that you that you may have. John dives a lot into a lot of these topics. He has a very popular blog called Simple Programmer, uh, and he also a very popular YouTube channel where he covers a lot of the same topics. But it's a very useful thing if you're looking to kind of grow beyond a software developer into the other skills that are, are required. And lastly here, uh, I have one book that's kind of going to turn into two. Uh, this book is called Deskbound by Kelly Starrett. Kelly Starrett is a PhD in uh Physiological science, I forget what he is. He's been on the uh, Tim Ferriss podcast quite a few times. Long story short, uh, he has written a book about uh, how sitting down is, is slowly kind of killing us and how we can basically use our desks as standing desks to help improve and what are the best ways to do that. He This book just doesn't talk about how it's cool to be at a standing desk. He actually <laughs> talks about the reasons why and the different physiological reasons why it's important to stand and move a certain way. He actually shows you how to, you know, properly sit down, how to properly sit in your chair, how to properly stand up. I mean, you're probably standing wrong if you're standing right now. That's the level of detail that this book gets into. Tons of information. You need to purchase a physical copy. It has tons of pictures. It's like full of pictures. Great content. Uh, I really love it. I'm still absorbing all of it right now. This book was actually... Uh, the second book I read on this topic because a couple of years ago I had some pain in my back and I couldn't get rid of it. And Kelly Starr talked about this book called Eight Steps to a Pain-Free Back. And that's the second part of this recommendation. This book by Esther Gokhail, probably completely murdered her name. Sorry about that. Um, is a book, again, it's called Eight Steps to a Pain-Free Back. If you have problems with your back, lower back, upper back, your arms, your neck, anything like that, your hips, you have uh, sciatica, anything of that nature, you need to pick this book up. Again, physical copy. This one is also full of pictures. It's about changing the way that you move so you're moving properly the way your body is designed so you're no longer in pain. I'm happy to report years later, I have no pain anymore in my back, hips, sciatica, anything like that. That's fantastic. So if you're having anything like that, check out that book. Yeah, uh, I remember you recommended this book uh, to me and so like uh, that's why I've read it. Uh, but mm -hmm. I know, Don, like, just look, standing at my desk, I have a standing desk at work, uh, just looking cool there, that was enough for me. <laughs> yeah, it's usually enough for most people. Yeah. That's why I got my desk. <laughs> uh, all right, so there we have it. I think, uh, and again, folks, we'll drop links to uh, all of these books in the show notes. I think this is a really solid Definitely, list. Definitely, I agree so. Uh, all right, and so if you have if you feel like you have, uh, these book recommendations have helped you and you'd like to hear more, just let us know. We have, like, uh, Don, like Don mentioned, we had like a whole bunch of other books as well that uh, didn't necessarily make the list, but, you know, are still great books, so... We'll definitely drop those if folks are interested. Uh, and if folks want to find out more about these books uh, and like, you know, ask a little more about your thinking about these books, Don, where do they do that? Uh, they can reach me at on Twitter is the best way. And that's going to be at Don Felker. And Kaushik, if folks want to complain to you about JavaScript, how do they reach you? Twitter at Kaushik Gopal is probably the best way, but I will let you know, I will cave in, uh, I will cave in pretty easily and together we jointly like feed off the negative energy. <laughs> so you're not necessarily going to get what you want. So, but 
<laughs> Kaushi Gopal at Twitter is the best way to reach me. All right, folks. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, let us know. Like, we want to try something a little different because, like, we got a couple of requests for this one. Let us know if you like this episode uh, at our Twitter handle, Fragmented Cast. Uh, and thank you all for listening. We'll catch you in the next episode. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.